All righty. Well, hello, hello. This is Alora Chestikoff from Firebird Summit, and welcome to this week's episode of Grow or Die. Hey, hey, everyone. It is great to be back with you once again. Lawrence Henderson from Boss LLC. Alora, how goes it? Uh, busy. Extremely, extremely busy. And I am, as always, happy to take some time and slow down a little bit and have a chat with you, my friend. Oh, so you, well, I think, have some cool stuff going on. It's got some great fodder for us today. So I what do. are we going to talk about today? Yeah. So... Uh, over the past couple weeks, uh, with everything that's going on in the world, um, as professionals, as people, we, we like to uh, create space for quiet, right? And, and particularly uh, me and you, right? As coaches, we understand the power of quiet, the power of getting still. But then there's a power of intentionality and, and making decisive uh, taking decisive action, being intentional with the things that you do. And I know it all sounds like t-shirt material, but there's something to it when you choose to do things that are going to not only be inspirational, but impactful for yourself. So the power of intentionality, that's, that's, that's what's coming up for me as a thing. So I love this one because, you know, I think, um, <laughs> here I go again, you know, Brene Brown talks about kind of our addiction to being busy, right? It's like this, it's, it's you got to do a little bit of everything. You got to constantly be, and when we put this sort of high value on the idea of, well, you know, I didn't get enough sleep and I have too much to do and I don't have enough hours in the day. And, and it, it kind of is this whole, like, it's a really deeply baked in kind of sense of scarcity that I think we all have um, this inclination to sort of buy into. And I'm, I think, you know, sure, there's always, you know, more stuff that you could try to fit in your day if you had more hours or more time or more energy or whatever. But the truth is, I think one of the things I love most about her work is that I am totally on board with the idea that a scarcity based view of the universe is bullshit that doesn't serve you. Um, but I also completely recognize, um, especially in hindsight, right, the points at my life when I just happened to be in environments or in cultural kind of settings where there was this super high premium placed on going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting and not having enough time. And that whole like status crap about, you know, not getting enough sleep or, or you know, working while you were on vacation or other dumbass things like that, right? That, you know, like a sane rational person looks at and says, dude, you crazy? Why the hell would you be proud of that? Like, this is not good. Um, but the truth is like some environments really, really cultivate that. And really it turns in, becomes a, you know, there's a certain amount of peer pressure around really like falling into that. And so what I love about your point about intentionality is that understanding when we are just simply caught in the momentum of being busy for the sake of being busy is usually when we realize we're not getting shit done that we need to get done. And we can't just, you know, keep falling into, oh, I have, I have to run from here to here to here to here. And then get to the end of your week and be like, what did I do again? I don't, I, I, I'm exhausted and I feel like I was busy all week long. But it, when I look back, I don't feel like I was productive. And I think it's such an emotional and psychic drain to get to the end of your week where you yeah. do feel like you've been run ragged and then also feel like you actually didn't get anything useful done. And so for me, the great thing about being super intentional is that the moment you start making small steps to doing that, the moment you is the moment you start realizing that a the world is not going to burn itself down if you don't go to a meeting. Like there's so many things that we kind of convince ourselves and it's like, there's so much ego involved in it. Like there's so many things that we kind of convince ourselves like we have to do or it's super important for us to participate. And, you know, and when it's all said and done, no, most of it's going to be just fine without you. You can go do what you actually need to do and you can shelf some of that crap because not all of it is actually serving you in any kind of useful way. Yeah, I love that because well, what's coming up for me, it's, it's uh, this question I, I like to ask people and, and what I've asked myself over the past several months when we've been having our conversations, am I working on the right work? 
and and one and, and I love how you you say, are we aware of what's actually leading us, and is it actually serving us? Is it impacting our lives in a productive way, like we say we desire, right? Because again, and and then then it goes to who am I doing this for, right? At the end of the day, um, and again, we always talk about some stuff. Yeah, that that just needs to happen as a result of, of life and situations. But when you really boil it down and you talk about intentional intentionality, it like action and, and going towards things, the intention of it needs to rise to the top so it can have some meaning or you can at least grade the thing. You're like, you know what? I did all of this stuff. I got the grade at the end of the week and nothing I actually did served me. It didn't serve the greater purpose of me. And, and um, somebody asked me today, it's like, if I, if I had to, another coach, uh, Jill Chapman out in Cali, she asked a question. She's like, if you could sum up kind of three words, three words that help filter and help people know when you're serving yourself fully and wholly, what are those words? And I come back to these combination of words that I said, and it's been saying for a year now, aligned availability. And this power of intentionality goes back to, I'm not only available, but I'm only available for the things that align with what I desire to be involved in. And then the things that I believe are connected to my why. And, and again, just understand the power of intentionality. And then do you know why you're doing it in the first place? And that always comes back for me because in the military, again, we do because we do. We do because we got ordered to do. And now what orders are you giving yourself? All right? What, what laws, rules are governing your life? And, and I believe once people become very conscious and begin to do some self-awareness work, some self-management work, you like, oh, put those glasses of reality on probably could have been doing something else. So I love, so I talk to a lot of people, especially like in more corporate settings where like there's so much sort of external pressure that, oh, this has to be done or drop what you're doing now because we have to go take care of this thing. Um, and I always kind of come back to, you know, making a distinction between what's urgent and what's important. Um, and to me, that's really where a lot of intentionality comes from, right? Because I think it's so easy to get caught up in the momentum of what's urgent because it always feels like, first of all, because there's always more of that than you have time for, right? So it's ne it will never go, it's like email. It will never go away. You will always have more of it coming at you than you can possibly deal with. And it doesn't matter what hacks or tricks or anything you figure out to, to more get more efficient and manage it faster. All it's gonna do is make room for even more of it to come at you. So it's just gonna keep coming. That will never stop. And you have to kind of at some point stop and say, okay, I have two choices. Either I can dog paddle my way through this every hour of every day and not get anything else done, or I can step aside and say, okay, look, I'll scan it as it comes in, but dude, I have things that are actually important and responding because, you know, somebody got a bug up their nose about something that actually was totally irrelevant and they misunderstood something. Does it, you know, that's not important for me to spend my, you know, what little time I have here going back correcting them, getting like, getting their knickers out of a twist, whatever the hell it is, like, that's not important. So they want to have a temper tantrum, they can have a temper tantrum. I'm not like, and there are so many things like that, where it's like, you know, that, that sort of burst, somebody's burst of emotion creates this false sense of urgency. It's like one of my dad's favorite, favorite sayings ever. He said it all the time when I was growing up. And then when I got into the business world, I realized I actually wanted it tattooed on my face was lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. And, and I see that, and, and I, you could even say the same is true of the, of the urgent versus important question, right? Because, you know, urgency for you does not constitute importance for me. And, and I can, I'm the only one who can go back and, you know, figure out what is important for me. Um, and there might be times when I allow someone else's priorities to kind of, you know, overlay it. That's very true in project work. I mean, when you're doing project-based work that has deadlines and you've taken on a commitment to do a certain 
you know, set of work within the con confines of a project timeline, like that can happen, but you, you, you have to keep that in mind because <laughs> projects done, you got a break, you got time, or you have other things, or you have four other projects just getting started. Guess what? Now you have to figure out again, back to what's important. So yeah. I love, I love that. Yeah. And I, I love the, the urgent, uh, versus important because that's where, what does success look like, I believe, gets blurred for an organization, right? And I believe people, they they believe they have a target. They believe they know what they're shooting at, but it gets lost in the minutia of it all. And, and they really get off. And, and again, when everybody's talking at a high rate of speed or you're only reacting to the person with the bug up their nose, like that literally can get people off target. And we were all here, but now part of the team's over there because they're reacting to the bug in the other person's nose. And that's the problem they're trying to solve when no, our success markers are here. Like they're, they're still here. They never moved. It's just the person. And, and I believe when you talk about, you know, the power of intentionality, the who's you, you need to answer who's involved in this. Who has a part to play in what this looks like for me? And then who, who have I allowed <laughs> to be a part of this party? And, and again, that's even, that's conscious versus unconscious seeds of crazy that you've planted. So that again, what you do is in accordance with per, sometimes a perception of, of a scenario, right? And so going back to, am I working on the right work? And who did I clarify this with? And, and this is where uh, I like to tell people, and you brought up something that, I, that, I, that I've been training on uh, for the past month with an organization around constructive conflict. And again, you hearing it might twinge a little bit because you're hearing uh, conflict and you're having this fight or flight response, even just with the word conflict, but no, constructive conflict. Right. And, and whose emotions are we processing here? Right. <laughs> Yours or the perceived ex example or the experience that you're you're projecting onto someone based off of your previous interactions with it. And we and to me, when you talk about intentional intention and power, the power of it, you really need to check yourself about what am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? Right, and, and because again, we all know we can potentially project onto people our own level of anxiety around things. And in this season, I, I told somebody the other day because they they missed a meeting and they were like emailing profusely apologizing. Oh my God, I'm so so I'm so so I'm so I'm so. I was like, look, this is the season of grace. I and 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 again, I don't even know how long this is going to extend, but that's how I'm going to choose to respond to every single person. This is a season of grace. We'll, we'll converse and we'll talk when we're supposed to. Why? Because I know it's a person on the other end of that message. It's not a widget. It's not a robot. And so the intention I choose is grace with every single person, even if it was malicious on your end. So what? That's none of my business. You got to deal with that. I'm, I'm going to operate and deal with what you gave me. <laughs> so it's so funny you said that. So a couple things popped to mind right there. So first, actually, I think one of the things that you mentioned, right, is about is about you know kind of letting other people drag you from your focus on what's important or you know really what the goals are. And to me, this is one of the most difficult things to get leaders and organizations to understand that they are capable of derailing things more than anyone else and more than they even recognize. The fact that, you know, Marshall Goldsmith has a, a great article that I love, you know, it's not a fair fight when you're the CEO. And he specifically talks about, you know, when a CEO sits in a room with his, with his team and they start brainstorming, the moment he starts throwing out ideas, the room stops coming up with other ideas and they all focus on his. And he didn't even know, like, you know, in, in this example, he didn't even understand that that's what he was doing. He thought he was being helpful. He thought he was being constructive, but he really tended to underestimate, you know, the extent to which just by virtue of stating an opinion, he sets the tone in the room 
and prevents other people from going. You know, and I think that's something that it's so hard because you know, I've I've been in leadership roles where I caught myself doing that after the fact and I realized, holy crap, I did it. You know, I don't think of myself as, you know, the leader who has to be right. Like I, I didn't speak up because I had, you know, because I thought that I had to be or that my team should think I was. I was literally spitballing ideas. And it was so hard for me to recognize that keep your damn mouth shut. Girl, the moment you speak up, your team shuts up. Like if you want ideas from them. And so I, I, I had actually learned to have my team meet without me because I, I was not trusting myself enough to keep my damn mouth shut. And I watch this with leaders all the time and they don't think they're doing it. They don't think that they are setting the tone and they're shutting people down. They really tend to believe, no, no, I have a very egalitarian relationship with my team. They're all allowed to speak up. No. Say what you want. The only person who's got an illusion around that is you. Your team is going to go the direction you point, even when what you're pointing at is off the edge of a cliff. So keep your damn mouth shut. Let them brainstorm without you, but do not assume that in Marshall's statement, everybody's created equal here. It, you, it is not a fair fight. You want to, you want to open your mouth and you're a leader of a team. You, you've just decided the direction your team's going to go and you've You've effectively shut down any real resistance, better ideas, contrary opinions, or brainstorming that was going to happen without your involvement. And that is not the best way to get good, productive work out of a team. Yeah. And, and, and what comes up for me right there is when that happens, and, and I'm just thinking about just leaders like me and yourself, like, I don't care what room we're in. I'm not, I don't feel there's no pecking order. If I'm in the room... I'm a subject matter expert and whatever is about to come out of my mouth is relevant and it's useful, but that's not everybody's, everybody didn't get groomed in that. And, and so there's a level of perceived uh, lack of safety, if you will, that, or like you said, there is some type of experience with uh, invalidation of previous moments when they did share or when they did speak up and the leader not being aware in receptive or even having the in intuition to even feel the room because like you said when a leader speaks up everybody shuts up and like and sometimes I I used to do it I began to be an over explainer because no one would give me input I'm like I'll be going I'm like nobody else has any ideas they're like no sir those all sound great I've literally listed 15 things that conflict with each other and nobody has anything They're like whatever you choose, sir, we're just going to move, move forward. And, but that makes you crazy. Cause you're like, dude, I oh. just gave you 50. They, <laughs> you can't have them all. Like you have to pick. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, 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 it, and it, and it, the empowerment part of it is like you said, what tips, tricks, and things can you create some intention around so you could build capacity because that really that's really when we talk about the power of intentionality and the power of intention is is making sure that there's some capacity that's an assumption that capacity is there for you to begin to recognize some things and and those folks that are listening watching think about yourself think about the environments that you find yourself in and if those environments are not a co-creative space right not just collaborative right? Collaboration is easy button, right? We're in a, a sprint and everybody gets to put colorful stickies on the wall, right? No. Is it co-creative where respect is, um, and, and again, I love this definition that somebody gave me of respect today, of respect is I see you as a gift and I admire the excellence you bring to the table. I'm That's an awesome. That's an awesome definition. I was like, mind blown, like, what? I was like, that's the respect I want. Like, that's what I want to exude to people. And I really believe in the hearts of a lot of people, they want to show, they, they want to create an intention around being in the game, being impactful. But what's reciprocated back to them causes them sometimes to retreat or sit still. And so th those are the things that I believe when we think about what steps are we going to take? 
I think we have to give ourselves permission to keep coming to play every day. We got, you got to give her, we got to give ourselves permission. Yeah, that, that's, that's really what I'm thinking about, particularly in this next season of life, mm-hmm. Alora. I so want people to lean into their power, lean into what they believe in, because I, that's the secret sauce. That's the secret sauce for me. So, so how would you, so somebody who's not in the habit of doing that, right? Somebody who's trying to, trying to start building that muscle yeah. memory. What are some things that you would, you would advise them to, to try? Off the top, get a coach. Um, <laughs> hire a coach and I'm not playing. I know I'm not yeah. Justin yeah. at all. Um, because the, the, the moments of clarity for me happened when someone co-created a space that was safe. And I didn't mean, I, I, that, was, that was intentional rhyming. I needed a safe space and getting coaching for myself was that moment, right? I'm married, but my wife's not a coach. My wife's a professional and an excellent professional in her own right, but I needed somebody with a skill set to help me get through some of the, the, the muck that was in my brain and stuff, like the cloudiness to get through and to see clearly. And again, and they didn't take it from me. They helped me begin to navigate and begin to put guardrails around things. Um, and so the first step I would tell anybody, let's say you don't have the capacity, you don't have the resources, you don't have the money right now for coaching. I would say, just read, who can you talk to? Because a lot of times you don't have anybody you can start throwing spitballs at a wall with, right? Journaling. Journaling is a great first step to create clarity, right? Mind mapping as a, as a free tool. You can Google mind mapping right now and it's a million templates that'll pop up that and, and give you definitions mm-hmm. on how to mind map. And just to get those ideas out, just to get yourself started. Because those, you have to get started. Like you have to take that first step. You have to make that first intention a reality and and turn it into an action for yourself. Okay. So what's, what's the hardest, what's been the hardest thing for you to do about trying to get and maintain some, some intentionality for you? What, what things do you catch yourself in the moment thinking, why am I doing this? I know I should do that. Yeah. When, um, Trying to operate on E, lack of self-care, is, is really when I find myself like, what am I doing and why am I doing it, is, is when my the check engine light has come on and then the gas light came on and I'm like, how do I make it this far on E? And then, oh, <laughs> without maintenance. Like, I'm yeah. like, I'm, t- I'm a total mess right now. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's how I know. <laughs> Check so what, what do you do? So what do you do when you find yourself in that moment? Or like, geez, how did this happen? What, what am sh- I doing? Shut it all down. Yeah, got to shut it all down. Got um, that's when getting quiet, um, and, and literally uh, several several times in, in during certain weeks that I have stuff on my calendar. If I have the ability to move it, and, and you notice your body, right? Your body, your body won't lie to you when when it's time to to step away from them, some things. So if you have the capacity to shift your schedule, shift your calendar or build in um, some self-care things. You, you, you have to do that, particularly with all of us working from home. You, you have to unplug. You have to intentionally put things in your path that help you unplug. And it goes back to that intention. Um, and there was a clarity exercise that, um, that Coach Giselle I mentioned earlier. She helped me just the intentionality of putting a one minute reminder on your calendar, uh, just a check-in of why you're doing what you're doing. Being intentional with intentional with just some reminders of are you working on the right work, but then the reminder of the intention behind the work. And, and just something as simple as that, right? Again, we're thinking about items with that don't cost you money. Using the resources and the tools you have right in front of you. Reminders of why I'm doing what I'm doing. And just those check-ins, just from today, is you know what? I'm working on the right work more often than not. And take care of you because an empty you can help anybody get going. Yeah. And I think that to me is, is the part that is always the hardest to remember Mm -hmm. until you are on operating on empty, right? 
So yeah. I think the reminder thing is super useful. I use that one a lot, actually. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I was talking to uh, I have a, a friend who's going through some stuff right now and she was, and she called me and she was upset. And she said, you know, I don't like, I just, I'm obsessing about this. I can't, like, I can't stop. And I can, and I keep catching myself. She goes, How, like, I can't focus on work. I can't sleep. Mm-hmm. I'm not doing anything. I'm just completely preoccupied. And so we talked through, you know, different things she could do. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I said, you know, one of the things, one of the things that I think is so hard about breaking habits is that in order to break a habit, you have to be aware that you're doing something in time to stop yourself from doing it. Right. And most habits are subconscious. So we like, it's, it's just a crappy cycle. And so like, there's all kinds of little, like stupid little things. Like I love uh, the rubber band trick, right. Put a rubber band around your wrist. And this is, I think, especially useful in a work from home situation where like I spend the damn video calls, you know, here it's like, you know, my, what, I'm, I'm, I'm running calls or I'm, you know, having conversations or I have meetings with 20 people on, on video, you know, I can't necessarily get up and move in the middle of that. Right. I have to say that, but if I catch myself doing something, you know, I can snap a rubber band on my wrist to help bring me back and focus. And so I think there's so many little things that, that we can look at. And some of the stuff that I think can be super useful, like you mentioned timers, right? One of the things that I used to be really bad at and, happily, I'm actually not so bad at it anymore, is I used to procrastinate. And especially around housework. I am the least domestic human being on the face of the earth. Like I, if I, if my dogs had opposable thumbs, I would let them wash the dishes and just deal with whatever breakage they manage because that is, I, I suck at it and I hate it. But one of the things I, I, I realized in kind of trying to get, get over that hump and stop, you know, letting laundry pile up for six weeks and then have to spend a week doing it, like that kind of stuff, right? Is that I, I kind of ultimately discovered that I can kind of put up with anything for 15 minutes. And so it actually, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, dishes or whether it's working on my taxes, which is that that's probably the one big thing I like continue to procrastinate on is like bookkeep, end of your bookkeeping for my, for my accountant, right? Is it like, whatever it is, if I can focus, 15 minutes, I don't have to finish the task. I don't have to, um, you know, get through everything. I just have to be able to say, okay, look, I'm going to start here and I can set the timer on my phone for 15 minutes. And for 15 minutes, I don't do anything else. I don't get distracted. I do, and I just get done as much as I possibly can. And at the end of that 15 minutes, I allow my, I grant myself the permission to walk away. And it was only when I started doing that that I realized that my own perfectionism had been getting in my way because I would look at a task, whether it was doing dishes or whether it was, you know, whatever, uh, cleaning the backyard, whatever it was. Like I would look at a task and I would see how big it was. And it was just overwhelming. And the idea that like, oh God, I'm gonna have to spend like all day Saturday doing this. And then then Saturday rolls around and I think, oh, geez, I just, I don't want to do that. And so it wasn't, and I didn't, I didn't really acknowledge that I was being kind of all or nothing about it, right? Like that all or nothing thing is so unhelpful sometimes, you know, and to be able to like look at something again, and it doesn't even matter what it is and just say, you know what, I grant myself the permission not to finish it, but I'm just going to focus at the exclusion of everything else for, you know, whatever amount of time. And the thing is, once you, once I started doing that, I started realizing that, A, my relationship with time was actually far more in my control than I thought it was. Because <laughs> I've always very much, because especially back then, I used to really feel like I was the victim of, of father time, who was just beating me <laughs> over the head on a regular basis. But I also started realizing that, you know, you can actually get a lot done. Like when you have a, a brief burst that where you're truly focused and it's almost never going to kill anybody if you walk away from it after 15 minutes without it being totally finished, but you feel better because you can actually start to see progress. And to me, all, all aspects of any habitual kind of, kind of behavior have, have real value in doing that, right? Where you're trying to break a habit or you're trying to set new habits. Don't, don't look at the whole whale. Really, it's, you know, it's, it's actually one bite at a time. You don't, you don't need to do the whole thing at once. And I think we get so preoccupied with, like, you can say, like, you know, my focus is intentionality. Well, 
that could be across your entire life, your, your yeah. relationship and your spiritual life and your professional life and your financial existence and your future, like, like, holy mackerel, that's like a big mountain. Or you can just say, you know what? I'm going to start here. Um, my intentionality, like for me, for this week, my intentionality was specifically, I'm getting back to an intermittent fasting schedule. Since we moved to Colorado, I've been eating, like I've been grazing like a cow in a field. I have not stopped. And now I'm like, oh my God, I can't fit any of my clothes. And oh yeah, I'm getting married next spring and I don't want to actually have to buy a dress the size of a tent. So it's time for me to get back to my schedule. But one of the things I've learned to do is say, okay, yeah, I need to get into an exercise routine. I need to get back eating healthy. I need like all these things I need to do. I can't, I don't start them all at once. Like I don't wake up Monday morning and be like, okay, all the bad stuff is gone. Only good stuff. Like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> like that's yeah. how we set ourselves up for failure. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So week one, I'm just going to do one thing. It's one thing. Just in court, get start re-engaging that muscle memory for how do you do this? Great. Now that I'm kind of in a groove there, I can add one more thing. Don't, but like all of that comes back to don't, don't overestimate how much you have to do to make progress because progress is one step at a time. Yep. So if being intentional means, look, I'm going to have a phone. I'm, I'm going to talk to, you know, my father once a week and I'm going to talk to my grandmother once a week. Like that's, that's it. My, my sense of intentionality around prioritizing my family and connecting with people that I don't get to see on a regular basis and checking in on them in a time of COVID where they're both, you know, in high risk kind of situations. Mm -hmm. You know what? That is a good place to start. Yes, there's more that I want to do. There's more that I can do. But start by doing things that set you that start building momentum and setting you up for success, mm -hmm. and that start feeling good. Like I, I just got an email from a woman who she had done something super helpful, and she's like one of those people that you love working with because mm -hmm. she's aside from fact she's got a great attitude and she's she's a wonderful you know sort of generous and and very um, easygoing person to interact with. She's also like one of the most crazy busy people in the entire organization. And yet she never drops a ball. She always follows up immediately, very thoroughly, gets everybody, you know, moving like no matter what. Um, and I'm constantly amazed at how this woman who I, it takes me like two weeks to find a date on her calendar when I can actually get 30 minutes of her time. And yet she is so on top of everything immediately. She doesn't let stuff sit or Oh yeah, I'll follow up on that and then take three days. Not never. Like we we got off our call, and within five minutes, I had I was cc'd on an email that she sent to everybody else, following up on all the things we had discussed and just done. And I'm like, you know what? One of the things to your point about respect is that I am trying to be more intentional about thanking people who are just a true joy to work with and who make everybody else more successful by simply being good and, and reliable and dependable and respectful in how they function. And so, you know, I, I wrote her an email and she wrote me back today and was like, that's so sweet. Like, I, like, that makes me feel so much like, and those kinds of things also build on, on it. Right. Like, do. and I think especially, and we've talked about this before, right. But I think one of those things that when you are on empty, one of the nicest things you can do, especially, you know, you find yourself like, like I had a couple of days over the past couple of weeks where I was exhausted by like one o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm looking at my calendar. I'm like, oh God, I got another four hours worth of meetings to go. Holy mackerel. Like, and there's nothing I can do about them. These are not meetings I can move. I don't like I have 20 people and each one of them just waiting for me to get there. And all I could think of was how do I find some energy to help stay focused? And for me, part of it is, you know, stuff like that. It's just dropping early. It was like, like a three line note. I'm like, you know, I just, I just want you to know, I really appreciate this because helping validate that she is being enormously valuable makes me feel better too. And especially when I know I have to defer my own self-care for another, you know, five hours worth of meetings or whatever it is, you know, sometimes just doing something nice or saying something nice or thanking someone for doing something that you find meaningful and valuable, sometimes that can just help just enough to get back to your point, right? About it's people, they're not widgets. And, yeah, and sometimes, yeah. sometimes we just need to remember that, you know, saying thank you for 
being helpful and, and for, you know, just being awesome is not, that's not a bad thing at all. That's, that's, that's positive all the way around. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things that, um, I love retired SAR major that uh, uh, I used to converse with. He he always said, what are my manufactured wins that I could create for myself? So that, like you said, I infuse energy. I infuse um, a smile, kindness throughout my day. And he, and he just talked about these little W's. Like you said, something getting back on task, right? Level of intentionality, not... Yes, the objective is to eat the elephant, but one bite at a time. Have the intention around the one bite, not the overall goal. Yes, the goal is down there, but the intention is to take one step. And, and again, I don't know if I've, I've said this before, but one of my favorite movies to date is, is Creed 1, right? I'm a Rocky buff. Me and my brother got in a Rocky years ago, but Creed, and when he was learning how to train his body to actually become an elite boxer, it was one step at a time, one punch at a time. And rock, and just that that whole scene in the drama is like one step at a time, one punch at a time. And again, the intentionality to take that step, right? Because a lot of people, when they know, like, you know what, I gotta go all the way down there. Ugh. They, uh, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, they're cemented. And then and, and fear and anxiety and all, like you said, the gremlins, of, of, you know, of Christmas past, um, start, start coming up for them. And he's just like, but just take the step. If you, and again, at this stage, the intentionality, even of a half step, you moved. The grace in, you moved. The grace in the thank you, right? And, and just those in setting simple intentions for yourself. Meet yourself where you are, but also, again, have a goal of where you desire to be. And, and that's the part of it. And then make up the distance in your pacing, your cadence until you get there, right? And, and just saying yes, one, one yes a day, by the end of the year, you're at 365 of them, right? And, and just going there and, and just really peeling it back that way. Um, I love the power of intention. I love it. Well, and I think, you know, when it comes down to it, I think the, the it's really, um, again, it's, it's easy to get caught in other people's momentum, right? And if you're always kind of in environments, you know, and I think, I think it's, it's sometimes easy to get swept up in it when you're surrounded by, you know, high performers, or you've got, you know, other things that are either very, you know, urgency driven a lot, or, or personality driven, you've got a leader who's really just all over like this, you know, the, the goals of the organization. And I think, I think it's really easy to just kind of just fall in line, right? You just fall in line behind that and you can get kind of caught up in the, in the wake of their momentum and just sort of cruise along with them with at it. But at some point that comes to an end, you know, at some point, you know, they leave the company or the, or, or, or the project ends or whatever it is like that comes to an end. And, and if you are really lucky, you might be able to jump onto someone else's bandwagon and go for a while longer, but at some point other people's stuff stops. And you have to figure out what you want for yourself. Um, and I think it's really, I, I think to me, this is one of the things that happens a lot in, at middle age, right? I think so many of us get caught up in stuff that when we're younger, especially when we don't necessarily always feel like we have as much choice, whether it's because our income isn't you know, enough to support us or, or we go into the military where you know, other people are controlling our daily existence. Or you know, in my case, it was startups where it was like, no, you just like jump on this boat and everybody starts paddling and you just hope like hell you stay upright, you know, whatever it is. Like there were always other circumstances that could say, no, no, just heads down and focus, 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 focus. And at some point, other priorities like start to surface. You're like, okay, well, I'm married now. Like, actually, I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to, you know, go keep doing that. That's a lot of time and effort. And like, I actually like the person I married. So I kind of want to spend time with them like this. And like, all of a sudden, these other, and I think that's really what drives a lot of stuff for people, whether it's, you know, getting married or having kids or buying a house or, you know, whatever it is that, that surfaces all of a sudden where now you have multiple things that are important. And so reacting to one thing that's always urgent stops being functional for your daily life. And then you have to choose that, you know, I think the, the place that is often the most obvious 
is when people have kids and all of a sudden they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm not staying at the office until 10 o'clock every night. I am going to go home so I can see my kid. And, and it's always interesting to me to watch that shift in people because, you know, we, when we, when we get married or we, you know, meet a partner, a lot of times people who are inclined to sort of, you know, fall into other people's cadence for what they need to do might, you know, negotiate that with your partner. Cause it's easy to negotiate stuff like that with another adult, right? Like, Oh no, Hey honey, I'm sorry. I'm not gonna make them for dinner. I've got, you know, we've got this big project. We have this big presentation. We have this big, whatever. And yeah, you like, you, that you, you can't really have that negotiation with a kid. <laughs> so all of a sudden it changes the paradigm. But what I also find is once that paradigm is shifted, then you start realizing, oh, I could say no to more than just what I need to say no to for my kid. Like there's actually other stuff. And to me, that's really when people start really coming back to all that self-work and that self-management because then suddenly other people's priorities don't carry the kind of weight that, you know, it seemed fine to let them do when you were younger. Um, and so to me, that's the, that's both the fun and the difficulty of kind of like hitting middle age where you're like, hmm, no, you know, it used to be important for me to help, you know, all these old white dudes build their businesses. Gotta say, not so much for me anymore. I love it. I absolutely love it, Allure. And yeah, <laughs> and, it, and those are the things, right? You, and, I, and we talk to people, and I know you've been doing the same thing. It, we don't know. We, we literally all at the same time, there's no model of what the future is going to look like on the other side of something like this. It, if somebody is alive that went through the last pandemic in the U.S., I don't know if they've been, they're being consulted for their well, expertise. Since, well, since the last <laughs> pandemic was in 1917, they, they yeah. probably have, have some memory problems if they are so Exactly, old. right? And, and, and so I don't, I don't see a lot of those people get news conferences these days. So okay. you can, these are, everything that's happening to us today, they're all projections. Yeah. They're all projections, which make what you said so, so important for people to like, let's normalize saying yes to what's serving us and saying no or not right now to the other stuff and being totally okay with it because I, so, yeah. So, yeah. so i love the not right now right i think there are so yeah. many people who struggle to say no yeah so one of the best pieces of advice i think i ever heard was you know what if you're uncertain or you're feeling uneasy about anything whether it's you know something that someone else wants you to do or or a commitment that you're being asked to make or whatever. Maybe you don't, maybe you're not ready to say no. So say not yet. And you know what, if, if you don't get comfortable before that not yet expires and it goes away, then that's just, you know, then that's the way it unfolds. But sometimes you need to stop and think because especially those of us who actually historically have had a problem saying yes to too much, you know, learning to say no, learning to set boundaries or learning to, to set boundaries around the things that are truly important and start saying no to the things that are just urgent and not really all that important. Like that can be a really difficult thing to learn to do. And to your point about being intentional, it's like, if I know that these things are truly important to my life, to my future, to my family, to my business, whatever it is, and I'm not spending any time on them because I'm dealing with whatever crazy fires, you know, somebody else decides are important, then at some point, you know, that I can't say yes to all of these things if I'm not saying no to some of these. And, and that is a very difficult set of muscles to start, you know, building out. Um, and again, organizations don't exactly help us with this, right? Because they really just care about, they really care about the urgent stuff that they want you to do. They don't really give a damn about your important stuff outside of that, no matter how much lip service they might give to, you know, balance in your life. And, well, they, they, you know, at the end of the day, they want you to jump for what's urgent. And you have to be the one who holds the line there. You cannot let them let them win win that one, because otherwise there is again it never ends. Like it never ends. There is always more that's going to come at you, and you can't do anything about it. So you have to learn to say no. But again, sometimes no can be really tough if you're not in that habit. So maybe it's like not now. I need to wait. I need. I need a day, I need a week, I need a month, whatever it is, and buy yourself a little bit of time, because that's the other thing. A lot of times, 
sleep on it, wake up the next morning, and what somebody else thought was urgent yesterday is probably going to feel a whole hell of a lot less urgent to you today. Yeah, yeah there's a, there's definitely a lesson there for all of us, people, leaders, individual contributors, everybody. It and and again, is it serving us? Yeah. Coming back to that, and are you being honest with yourself uh, around the decisions that need to be made, right? And and again, our families need us whole. Our families need us healthy. And, and again, we, we owe it to ourselves to show up with, in a very authentic way, right? And so, no, I love, I love this one, Laura. I love this one. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this showed up well this week. Fantastic. Well, in that case, we are good for this week. So I am, as always, delighted to get a chance to talk to you, my friend. Always a pleasure. So, I hope everyone has a wonderful week, and we will be back. Uh, we'll be back ho hopefully just uh, before Thanksgiving next week. Hmm? Holiday edition. Okay, there we go. <laughs> well, we can talk about what we're thankful for. For sure. Absolutely. All righty. In that case, my friend, have a wonderful week. You as well. All righty. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.